Samaran often says that initially, the men of the Zabalin community were drug addicts or alcoholics and knew almost nothing about their own Christian faith. He describes them more or less as if they were pagans who had to be converted. <coughs> <coughs> <laughs> In this movie about Father Samaan's life, the story goes that he was constantly struggling to convince the Zabalin to go to church and to take their religion seriously. In the end, he was successful and he often presents the Zabalin as an example for other Egyptians to follow. The poorest and most uneducated people who became good Christians. Father Samaan built the first church in the neighborhood in the 1970s, in an area where there was no Christian place of worship at all, and he gave it a name that had never been given to a Coptic church. He dedicated it to Saint Samaan, the saint who was instrumental in moving the mountain according to the story of the Mukata miracle. فقال لهم يسوع فالحق أقول لكم لو كان لكم إيمان مثل حبة خردل لكنتم تقولون لهذا الجبل انتقل من هنا إلى هناك فينتقل ولا يكون شيء غير ممكن لديكم In the story, Saint Samaan plays a crucial role but at the same time, he remains in the background. Why then single out Samhan, this humble man who quickly disappeared after the miracle? Maybe it's because the modern father Samhan, the priest of the garbage collectors, thought of himself as a simple man without much education. And yes, the Coptic Church later came to include him in its long list of saints. And this makes him an important and, and famous person of the past. But, as Nagla Hamdi has argued in a recent article, he could actually be considered a lesser saint or small saint. This is a category used to describe such seemingly insignificant personalities who remain in the background even though their actions are seen as highly significant. Anyway, as we have seen in the previous videos, tradition recorded very little information about Saint Samaan as a person, and this allowed the priest Samaan to freely reshape the saint's story. In this way, the priest was able to fashion the saint in his own image. In the 1980s, he published the life, the hagiography of Saint Samaan, in which he recounted the action of the saint and the Mokata miracle. And in the 90s, he published a second version of it. He added his own life story at the end of the book, as well as the tale of the building of the Saint Samaan Monastery. So, Saint Samaan and Father Samaan lived were turned into one single story. This complex of seven churches was built from the beginning of the 1990s and is called a monastery even though no monks lives here. The name monastery is given because of its size and because it contains churches built in caves in the rock. These churches clearly refer to the Coptic tradition of hermits living in the caves in the desert. But how did Father Saman manage to build this enormous place of worship? Well, he may have had little formal education, but he certainly has considerable leadership and management skills. He was able to plan and implement his project because he maintained an impressive network of relationships with politicians and businessmen who helped him with money, building permits, logistics and so on. But on the other hand, he also had to negotiate his position within the Coptic Church by building strong relations with Pope Shenouda, the Coptic Patriarch from 1971 to 2012. And this was not so easy because Pope Shenouda was openly hostile to 
the innovative and charismatic trend to which Samaan belonged. Please remember what we told you about this in the first unit of this module. The Coptic Patriarch considered that salvation could not happen through a certain personal encounter with Jesus Christ in a kind of mystical experience. On the contrary, the Pope considered that salvation could only be attained after a long path of spiritual development under the close supervision of the clergy. In order to deal with this difference in views, Father Samaan made a kind of a deal with the Pope. In the first place, he skillfully managed to legitimize his own position within the traditions of the Coptic Church. As we have seen, the Mokata miracle was transmitted in the official history of this church and it was kept alive and adapted over the centuries. It is thus one of the most important and central stories of the Coptic tradition and Father Samahan linked its huge and famous place of worship to precisely this tradition. But he also dedicated the monastery to Pope Shenouda himself and made a statement explaining that the church could not have been built without his prayers. He even placed two statues of the Pope at the top of the biggest church of the monastery and Pope Shenouda in return visited the place several times. Above all, he agreed to recognize the relics of Saint Saman that were discovered during archaeological excavation in the mid-1990s. Why? Well, in the Coptic context, any new Coptic place of worship always gains legitimacy if it can be blessed by association with the remains of a saint. These relics were moved to the Mokatam complex during a solemn ceremony honored by the presence of Pope Shenouda in 1992. Then, at the end of the 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century, the story of the miracle of the Mokatam was further highlighted by Pharaoh Saman's activism. Again, the story gained new popularity among Copts and got to be known by many other Egyptians. But just as in the 1930s, this increased exposure did not come without controversy. For example, one Muslim journalist who had heard about the story considered it to be an expression of sectarianism. In his opinion, this story implied that the Copts had been persecuted in the past, which is often denied in the official version of Egyptian history. He pointed out that in Egypt, Christians and Muslims had always lived together in harmony and that this had also been acknowledged and defended by the most prominent members of the Coptic clergy. And indeed, such harmony was expressed at some highly symbolic moments as in the Egyptian revolution of 1919 against British colonial rule and during the revolution of 2011 at Tahrir Square in front of the international media. At the end of this sequence of videos, we hope that you have learned about and understood some very significant issues concerning the relations between Judaism, Christianity and Islam. We have seen a world in which fact and fiction are intertwined and in which stories change over time. It's a process that can only be fully understood if we are ready to work together patiently in interdisciplinary research teams and combine meticulous methods of text research with careful and critical historical inquiry. And all of this while keeping an eye open for the intricate relations between the past and the present. The Mukatam case study was the last topic of our course. We hope you have enjoyed the videos and that you've learned a great deal about the various oriental beliefs that we have covered here. But we're not completely done yet. Indeed, as you have seen, we have prepared for you some further activities to be carried out in our wrapping up week.